Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles program in which we talk about anything about the past and the present. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four co-hosts of the show, also known for my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing, being joined by my regulars, the writer for Beatles Examiner, and many Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have not only a writer for Beatle Fan, but a freelance writer for many uh, magazines and publications, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. And what we're going to do on the show this time is to kind of play catch-up with a lot of the news that's been happening in the past week or two weeks. And there's quite a lot that we haven't discussed here on this show uh, because we felt we had to talk about the Fest for Beatle fans, that being such a big event of uh, the last weekend. But uh, there's quite a lot of news about Ringo and about Paul. And there's also a major passing that I thought we'd bring up here on the show this time out. But first of all, let's talk about Ringo because as we speak, uh, his brand new album has just been released called Postcards from Paradise. And we are planning to do a review of that album on our next show. So we're not going to go into detail about the songs on the album. But just to let everyone know that the album is out, 11 new songs from Ringo, lots of different collaborations. And uh, as has been mentioned quite often, the first ever song in which uh, all the members of the All-Star Band uh, have a hand in writing it and playing on it. So uh, there's that news, but Ringo is kind of everywhere right now, and he's been giving a lot of interviews, and in fact, I had a chance to interview him yesterday for about 10 minutes over the phone, and we possibly will air some of that in our next show. But um, I thought we'd talk about, first of all, there is a cover story in Rolling Stone magazine. Ringo is on the front cover, and the whole article is about Ringo, and to me, it's kind of an examination of not only his life, but his character. And there's a lot of quotes in there, not necessarily from Ringo. There's some, but there's actually quite a bit from Paul McCartney in there, as well as um, uh, Joe Walsh and Todd Rundgren. And I wanted to know from you guys what you thought of this particular article. I was really impressed by it. How about you? Um, let's start with Al. It's uh, it's very interesting because he's he seems to have become much more reflective about, you know, the sort of especially the uh, the years there in the 70s and 80s, talking particularly about the, you know, going into rehab in, in 1989 and going over that period. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, it's, you know, as far as he's concerned, it's one of the best things that ever happened was going into rehab and it's, and it's very true. You know, when you see pictures of Ringo from uh, particularly the anywhere from the mid 70s, you know, through the 80s and see how puffy eyed he was and all. And in some cases, even bloated, you can see how much the partying and all, how, how, how much of a toll that took on him. And it, and it took a musical toll as well. You know, particularly in the '80s, uh, so the obviously the rehab was, you know, was a was a very big, a very big step. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing to, for him to be especially proud of is how he's yes. turned his life around very and what so. a healthy lifestyle he has. I think I'm not sure if it was Todd Rundgren, but he's he said that Ringo always smells from kale. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> And there was one moment in there when someone was observing that he was having a meal and it was all steamed broccoli and a baked potato. Yeah. And that was the whole meal. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's how he lives now. And it shows. He looks so good and so healthy. Yeah. When you and, consider that the man's going to be 75 years old in, in mm -hmm. just a few months, he looks absolutely um, – he's trim and – uh, in you know, totally fighting, uh, fighting shape. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys read this. It's actually at the very beginning of the article. But uh, Paul McCartney said he was having dinner with Ringo and Dave Grohl and their wives, and um, Paul just kind of joked to Ringo, knowing that he's been sober all these years. Why don't you have some whiskey? It won't kill you, you know. And Ringo actually said back to him, "Why? So I could look like you." 
<laughs> and then Paul said, and, and Paul said, I deserve that. And I, I could see that happening. You know, I could see Ringo answering back like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just goes to show you that Ringo has kept up this very healthy lifestyle. And give the man a ton of credit for this. So, uh, yeah. you know, he eats healthy. He's got all this energy. You can see it every time the All-Stars play. And he's got uh, an incredible enthusiasm for for all of his activities, recording this new album, everything that he does musically. He's just got this exuberance about him that, uh, you know, a lot of it, you have to give credit to him for, for changing his whole life around ever since, uh, you know, going into rehab. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of think the whole thing about the the acerbic comment. I think he's, he's, you know, his moods shift around. I think he can be really nice at some sometimes, and really, you know, I, I yeah, that 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 incident was kind of taken out of context. You kind of don't know how they kind of deal with each other. I wouldn't take that as seriously as maybe the the article seems to imply. But I thought the article was the the Rolling Stone thing was incredibly well written. Um, mm. Alan, you can probably you can probably um, speak on that, but I, I thought the guy did a great job with it. Um, you know, and and the question I thought the questions were pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I liked it too. I, I thought it was a, a good job. I mean, there were certain aspects that were the familiar old stories that, in a certain way, if you're going to do a, a, a large scale profile on Ringo, you have to do like the Octopus's Garden story and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. But but there were lots of new things. I mean, I, I didn't know that he wasn't shaking hands these days. He he was shaking hands, you know, through the 90s. I think the last time I interviewed him might have been about 97 or, or so. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, I don't remember him not shaking hands. It's kind of interesting that now it's, you know, it's apparently a germ thing. Um, yeah. And I think focusing on that and on his diet and stuff like that is kind of interesting. I mean, he jokes about how this is why people think I'm crazy. But, um, you know, the fact that he's taking such great care of himself, that he's in such great shape you know he talked mm -hmm. about how when he moved he took this found his sergeant pepper costume and still fit in it and that george had had to have his let out when he uh used it in the when we are fab video mm -hmm. um you know i mean he really is in incredible shape and uh <laughs> you know you see him on stage he's out there running around it's uh you know for for someone his age uh that's really something and given the fact that he was such a sickly kid you wouldn't have expected him to be, you know, the the Beatle in probably the best shape, you know, at this point of his life. Um, right. Well, I was going to say when I met him at the at the Walk of Fame thing, I think was that two thousand and eight. 2000, I can't remember what year it was. Two thousand and nine. Um, he not only shook hands, but he hugged. So he he wasn't being, you know, he wasn't doing the fist thing then either. Yeah, so it I, seems to come and go. Uh, sometimes he does the fist thing. Sometimes he'll shake hands. Mm -hmm. oh, there was one of the one of the news videos. I mean, some of the TV interviews he's doing. Um, there was a clip that just went up from I think the NME where uh, mm -hmm. his you know, female interviewer walks into the room and he does give her a hug. So uh, I don't know if you get less germs from giving someone a hug. <laughs> <laughs> hands, but... <laughs> Well, well, the whole shaking hands thing anyway, I mean, just as a historical uh, footnote, I mean, the, the idea of shaking hands dates back to back when you wanted to prove that you weren't holding a sword, you know, yeah. and so you would shake the hand of the person you were meeting to, to show that you were unarmed, and it, it's probably a little antiquated at this point. Mm -hmm. Maybe Ringo has a point. <laughs> yeah, maybe. There's a really good quote here from Paul early on which really kind of describes Ringo's character. He said, I don't want to bring in the violins, but we all came from hardship. Mm -hmm. All of us except for George lost someone. I lost my mom when I was 14. John lost his mom. But Ringo had it worst. His father was gone. He was so sick they told his mom he wasn't going to live. Imagine making up your life from that, in that environment. No family, no school. He had to invent himself. We all had to come up with a shield, but Ringo came up with the strongest shield. That's yeah. a pretty powerful quote there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tells you a lot about Ringo and why he is the way he is. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's probably also worth noting that in Mark Lewison's book, Ringo comes off as, 
you know, the most accomplished musician of the four at that very early stage of their career. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he was in all the good bands back when they were sort of just messing around, you know, and trying to do something. He was already in professional groups. And, uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny that he has the reputation as ha- or is joked about as having been sort of a late add-on and that, you know, there was that uh, Saturday Night Live sketch uh, when the Goldman book came out where uh, John Lovitz played Ringo and his big line was, I'm just happy to be here. You know, the, mm-hmm. the early history was actually a little different. Ringo was, was a, a hot drummer in, in Liverpool at the time, and uh, you know, I, I think I think he uh, deserves a, a certain amount of respect for the accomplishment that that he's brought uh, that he brought to the Beatles at the time and the uh, consistency that he's had through most of his career. I mean, he had that point in the seventies when when uh, he was probably drinking too much and the production slipped a bit. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, I mean, he's made some good stuff and, uh, the new album has lots of, you know, very pleasant stuff on it. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's like a lot of the Beatles solo things these days. It's, um, not what people currently listen to and buy apart from, you know, those of us of a certain age, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know but he's he's continuing in the tradition that he had you know grown up in and uh and and perfected to a degree so there's that but yeah i mean it, i was just sort of coming out of um you know what ken was saying about the paul mccartney quote uh they did all have hard times ringo did probably have it worse and yet his determination was such at an early age that he really made something for himself even before the Beatles. Yeah, even Mark Lewison said that he was the only one that owned a car. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, he was able to sustain as a musician, you know, before the Beatles ever happened from, uh, you know, working with Rory, I guess, and, mm-hmm. you know. I recall uh, a quote from John. Uh, he said much the same thing about Ringo, that Ringo was kind of like a local celebrity, and, and the fact that he did have his own car was part of that. Hmm. You know, there was something else you you mentioned, Mark Lewison, but I was reminded of something in this article where Paul McCartney's talking about the first time Ringo played with them at the Cavern, and everybody in the Beatles looked at each other there, and they just they thought this was amazing. It was mm-hmm. like I remember Mark Lewison writing about that that when Ringo joined, it was like they all kind of knew this was the right fit. Mm-hmm. Exactly what I've always said the 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 the, the final piece of the puzzle. Which makes that right. whole thing about how long it took to fi- for everybody to figure out about Pete Best even more astounding because it was it was right there in front of us all the time, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Wow. There's one other quote here that I'd like to read, and it actually comes from Todd Rundgren, just talking about Ringo's personality and how he is now. He said, "Imagine if you went from working class kid to royalty. It got to be a habit for him." not relating to people and slipping back into the celebrity mentality. Now he's much more open and gracious with our guests and us. He's become the person he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a very powerful statement right there. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. In fact, you know, you hear so many comments from guys who have played in the all-star band over the years about what a great band leader Ringo is. Mm -hmm. And who would have, uh, who would have imagined that? you know, years ago. Yeah. I mean, that was one thing that I asked uh, Edgar Winter when I talked to him a couple of years ago. I said, you know, we all know how Ringo is, how, uh, as a person, I mean, the personality, how was he as a band leader? And he, you know, he basically said he, he's don't no nonsense. I mean, he, he's not, you know, he's definitely in charge of that band. Mm-hmm. So everybody, you know, everybody seems to think that Ringo is very, you know, easy and, and and casual, but he's not. When it comes to the band, he you know he definitely uh, puts his foot down. And in fact, somebody sent somebody uh, had written me about one of the shows and said uh, they had, they were listening to the uh, rehearsal of one of the shows uh, out from outside, and Ringo said something about uh, he made some kind of comment uh, that let the band know that you know they needed to get their act together. So he's mm. he is not. 
yeah, he's definitely. I mean, that it says Ringo Starr in the All Star Band for a reason, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, that's that's he's, pretty, you know. And and he does never, you know, he always he never gets the credit really that he deserves. Everybody kind of you know looks at him, you know, in the shadow of Paul and the shadow of yeah. John and even the shadow of George. Right. And as you guys are saying. You know, he was very accomplished. He, you know, he's done. He, I mean, he was a, he acted, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to, you know, not all the movies were fantastic, but I mean, there were some, there were some very good movies that he did. Magic Christian, I think is a really good movie. Caveman has its audience. You know, you either like it or you don't. (laughs) That'll be the day. Yeah, that'll be the day. And that'll be the day is, is really interesting if you have not seen it, folks. Because mm-hmm. Ringo, Ringo has a little nudity in there, which is really kind of surprising. But that's the truth. I mean, you know. So I you mean, thought it's... that would happen in Caveman? You thought <laughs> that would happen in Caveman? <laughs> really, really, you know. So I mean, he's done some surprising things. He's really, you know, he's gone outside the box. And even the, even the, the, the scene in A Hard Day's Night that everybody, you know, talked about after that movie came out was was a real indication that Ringo was something spe- very special. And so, you know, that's it's really cool that uh he's getting this recognition now and uh you know, it's a you know, it's about time, damn it. <laughs> so, you know, apart from all the accomplishments that we've been talking about here, and it's something that maybe we'll elaborate more on when we review the new album. I really kind of sense when I when I spoke to Ringo that there's there's a confidence in him that's stronger than it's ever been before. And I think that comes from not only the, the accomplishments you just mentioned there, Steve, but 25, 26 years of doing this all-star band thing. He's, he deserves a, so much credit for doing that. And, you know, when you're in a band with all these great musicians almost every single year and you're putting together these spectacular shows and you're pulling it off and, you know, the performances are wonderful, I'm sure that builds even more confidence in you. So he has so much to be proud of, and, you know, I think the All-Star Band is is one of the biggest reasons why I think... think uh, Well, I was going to say, I think the Hall of Fame thing has something to do with it, too. The quotes I've seen from him is that he's incredibly proud of that Hall of Fame thing, being Mm -hmm. named Hall of Fame, incredibly proud of that. So I think that has that has something to do with it too, but yeah, yeah you're absolutely you're right though, you're right. Uh, you're certainly right about the All Star Band because one, you know, one would have thought if you know if there had been one, two, maybe three All Star Bands, you know, it'd be one thing. But the fact that the concept uh, has continued for, like you say, twenty basically twenty six years now, through several different incarnations. Um, and, and it's, um, it's been very successful. Yeah. That's, that's the other thing. I mean, he's, he sells out just about every show that he does. Mm -hmm. So not only are the performances great in and of themselves, but they've been commercially successful too. So apart from all the commercial success that he's had with his records, with the Beatles and with, you know, certainly the first half of the seventies, he's had all these other years with the, with the all-star band to be proud of. And mm-hmm. uh, and that, like you said, it's not just a phase of his career. It's been ongoing, and right. he still enjoys doing it. He loves it, and you get that feeling from when you see him live. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the All Stars, they will be resuming touring in October. There's a whole string of dates which Steve has posted on Beatles Examiner. But uh, you know, the thing I wanted to bring up, which uh, Steve and I talked about before we expanded our show is this incredible thing that he's got going with this current lineup because he's keeping the same members and this has been now for three years so he evidently really loves this lineup and the other thing i wanted to just mention about these dates in october i was surprised when i saw all the different venues he's playing but there are about nine shows i think that are all in canada (laughs) so this Mm. is a very this is the first time I remember him doing so many shows in Canada. But, uh, okay. you know, it's a North American tour. But, again, he, he evidently finds it important enough to work around these guys' schedules so that it can fit in time whenever he can. So that mm-hmm. just goes to show how important these, these musicians in particular are to him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, uh, just the mere fact that Todd Rundgren has been able to devote so much time 
to this band, you know, with all of his other projects, uh, the, you know, the, the various multimedia things that Todd's involved with, the fact that he's been able to devote that much time is a tribute to, to Ringo and to the concept of the band. Yeah. And Todd tours every single year. And not yeah. only that there are, there are years when he does more than one different tour. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, he's always busy, and I know that uh, Toto is going to tour Europe very soon. So Ringo's working around their schedules. It's that important mm-hmm. to him. So yeah. uh, I don't know about Greg Raleigh and and Richard Page and what they're doing, but you know the mere fact that he's taking the time to wait until everybody else is ready, he still wants to keep these guys. Mm-hmm. Well, I would get. I would guess that they they're kind of on call. As far as this, as far as the, and that's how you know it works out the way it does. Um, I'm sure he's told them to, you know, to make ready for tours, and he's probably. I I, I would guess. I, I I mean, I'm just guessing, but I would guess he's he's kind of alerted them, you know, to keep certain areas of time open so that, you know, they can do this. Um, like for example, with with McCartney, I mean, those guys, you know, have to keep certain dates. You know, his his dates get priority over, I'm sure, everything else. And I think that's probably mm. what happens with Ringo too. So, but yeah, it's nice that he's he's you know that he's really enjoyed touring with the same band, and you can tell there's definitely been a it's definitely improved the music of the All Stars. You know, having the same band, it's. Um, it's not like rent a band the way it was in the beginning and the way some other people work. Um, it definitely makes, it makes a difference. So, yeah. Alan, what do you think of this current lineup? Um, I, I enjoyed it when I saw it, um, last year and, uh, uh, not everybody in the group fascinates me as much as everybody else, but, uh, you know, nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually probably kind of a good thing to hear music that you're less familiar with. You know, the Mr. Mr. Guy is, uh, is the Rolling Stone writer put it, uh, uh-huh. and, and, uh, even Steve Luthaker, I mean, I sort of knew his work a little, but hadn't, it, it really wasn't totally on my radar. And, but you know, it, you're, you're expanding your horizons a little when you see it and in past tours, you know, sure. Sheila E, uh, you know, there's always someone who, probably you haven't listened to very much um that that's kind of interesting to hear there and and the other good thing about it is if if you do listen to them and say well i'm still not that interested they're only there for a song or two so it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's one of the great things about his concept you know you know in the the very early years i mean basically everybody in the band you knew all their work um but, uh, you know, I think they really play well together. I think I, I, I love Todd Rundgren, and I, I really like the idea that he's been working with him so much. He's been on several yeah. tours. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a very tight band. It it's a, gives a very enjoyable show. And, uh, yeah, I could, I could see that becoming uh, maybe semi-permanent. I mean, there are, there are still other people who I, I wish he would, you know, bring back maybe. Although, you know, some of them are, you know, we're talking about people uh, dying. I mean, Jack Bruce, you know, obviously. Yeah. And uh, so some of the people in the past uh, tours, um, you know, we won't see again. But, um, mm. you know, he's 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 had some really great lineups. I was looking a couple of weeks ago through some of the live CDs that they put out, including the, that anthology so far. And, mm, right. uh, you know, a lot of good stuff. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think this is a good group, and uh, I'm, I'm glad he's continuing with it, at least for a while. Yeah, it must be, you know, it's got to be a certain amount of work to keep changing the lineups every year, every two years. And maybe yeah. Ringo is just comfortable with these guys, and he wants to keep them as long as he can. But I don't know if I would say they're on call. I think that Ringo's kind of working around their schedules. Because certainly Todd Rungwin is, is one person that, like I said, he's, he's always busy. Exactly. There's never a year when, when he's not touring. You yeah. know, that may happen in the future as he gets older and he, and he can't handle performing so often. But, um, and also you got to realize that in the early years of the All-Stars, everybody then was a lot younger. 
and all those people were touring more more often. Um, mm-hmm. So these people being you know older, although Richard Page is younger than the others, I'm sure. But uh, you know they're not touring as much, so it's probably easier to work that into the schedule. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so Ringo, uh, uh, just a banner year for him coming up uh, for 2015. Mm-hmm. So let's move on to Paul. Uh, in the last few weeks, we've heard a lot of news about him uh, as far as concert dates are concerned. And uh, in addition to playing in Japan and South Korea, he's booked a number of shows in Europe, which will be in um, May, June, and July. He also announced that he will be part of the Firefly Festival, which is in Dover, Delaware. That's on June the 19th. He's going to be at the Lollapalooza Tour. That's uh, on July the 31st at Grand Park in Chicago. And in addition to all that, he's also going to be doing a, a benefit concert for the Robin Hood Foundation. And that's going to be at uh, Jacob Javits Center in New York City. That's pretty soon. That's on May the 12th. Mm-hmm. So Paul is very active, certainly in the United States so far. It's all big events as opposed to his own shows so far. So how do you guys feel about Paul? This is certainly not the first time in the last few years he's been at certain festivals like Outlands. What do you think of the idea of him doing these these huge festivals? It's interesting that he he in a way he's kind of been a trendsetter in that within the last few years when he played Coachella and some of the other festivals uh up to yeah. that point the sort of the senior acts the heritage bands, if you want to put it that way, um, hmm. really kind of shied away from those festivals, uh, thinking that, well, that's really the domain of the younger, you know, alternative rock bands and, you know, the, the young, the young artists. But the fact that, uh, that Paul fellow was challenging enough to play Coachella and play other, other festivals, play Glastonbury, uh, which he's done, of course, several mm. times, in a way has kind of opened the door for a lot of the, you know, the the, the older acts to uh, to say, OK, let's let's give it a try. Yeah, I never I never looked at it that way. Good yeah. point there, Al. Especially yeah. since these days, that's the way a lot of these bands are, you know, making uh, making their money because they're certainly not selling records. Right. So, you know, that's yep. how they. That's how they make their living these days is by touring and playing festivals and and on and on. Yeah, Elton John just announced he was doing Outside Lands in San Francisco. Yeah, which who would have imagined? Really, yeah, right, that, that, imagined really, that. that really blew me away. I was quite surprised that uh, that he would – because, I mean, he's he's got that – that show in Vegas. I mean, he's got a standing gig in Vegas, and and I right. was surprised that he decided to t- to do the one off in San Francisco. But mm-hmm. that's that's going to be that's going to be interesting. Personally, I, you know, and I have to admit, I haven't really attended any festivals, but I don't particularly like the idea of doing. Maybe call call me old, call me old fashioned, but I the 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 whole festival thing just is not my favorite situation um it's just way too you know there's just too many things going on i would rather go to a paul mccartney concert than a festival where you have to you know fight with crowds going to see other people although these days these days we don't really even have to go because in many cases the you know the acts are streamed either Mm. over the internet or uh you know or there's uh on-demand viewing various various options for actually seeing a lot of these acts or bootlegs because uh you know like for example well that uh, too sure well yeah uh, i mean but yeah, no. Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there was a lot of streaming. Although, usually, I mean, the for example, I know when they when they did Mexico, when he did Mexico a couple of years ago, they streamed part of the show. They didn't stream the whole thing, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. which was really kind of which was which was nice to at least see part of it. But yeah, I mean, this whole thing of you know, I, I'm I'm just not a big personally a big festival fan myself. Oh sure, um, but. You know, I understand that that's what you, you know, that's what you got to do. I mean, I understand why he's doing it. He's trying to make a inroads with younger, with younger listeners. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that that's a very obvious thing. And you have a band 
that um, has a very young face to it, even if they're not that young, that um, would get a, a lot of attention from younger fans. So, yeah. So, it, you know, it makes it makes sense. It's just not something I'm a, a big fan of myself. But anyway. So do we all feel, as Steve just uh, suggested, that that's why Paul's doing this, to reach younger fans? Or could it just be that he wants to do a few shows and reach as many people as possible? I mean, I like it or not, because I'm thinking, you know what it's like when sometime in the future you're going to be able to say to somebody, I saw Paul McCartney when, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, just like any of the icons of the past, this gives so many people who normally wouldn't go to pay money to see Paul McCartney in concert. He's on the bill with all these other people. Hey, you know, this I get to see Paul McCartney, too. Let me check him out. Mm-hmm. So there's that aspect of it too, but I don't. You really think that it's it's more to attract a young audience? Yeah, I kind of do because I think the younger audience is really what goes to the festivals. I don't know that the the older. I've heard a lot of comments from people who were saying, you know, about uh, you know the various festival gigs that they didn't want to they didn't want to deal with that situation. What do you guys think? I mean, that's I'm just talking about. What I've heard people tell me, you know, when they've heard about the about the festival gigs, uh, I mean, uh, granted, when when you see Paul in a situation like Candlestick, like we did last year, I mean, that's it's semi it's a semi festival gig, really. But um, you know, it's a one it's a it's a one it's one show, and you don't have to. It's not a big you know location uh, to where you know you have to. Uh, walk, you know, miles and miles and miles and miles. But uh, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with getting to a younger audience because there are a lot of younger bands there. I mean, he's going to, you know, he's one of the few veteran bands. The the acts that play those things are 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 young, basically. You know. Yeah, I think as Al said, it's really a little of both. But I yeah. also think, and we have to we have to see how this year plays out. But let's just say. And we know Paul's been touring every single year consistently for quite some time now. Let's just say he wants to take one year where he's not going to do any U.S. dates as just Paul McCartney. What better way to reach a, a large number of people than to do a few festivals? Mm-hmm. That could be part of what he's trying to do here. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But uh, no, either way, it's a good thing. As long as young people get to see him who normally wouldn't even think to see him or be exposed to his music... The most important thing to keep your music going is to be able to reach young people over and over and over again. And it's more and more of a challenge as time goes on. So, right. uh, you know, it's a very smart thing what he's doing if that's one of the reasons why he's doing it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it, it it's kind of in line with his his policy of trying to be musically challenging. So to play in that kind of of an atmosphere, which is very obviously very different from the, you know, the normal, you know, uh, concert atmosphere in a stadium or a big arena to do a to do a festival atmosphere is uh, it's, it's definitely it's a challenge for, you know, for somebody who's. You know, not only for him and his band, but also for the audience as well. Yeah. Actually, it's kind of ironic. I just thought of this, but um, Ringo is playing a festival. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Ringo, part of the shows that he's doing, there's one in Sonoma. Okay. Which is, um, it's all uh, veteran acts for the most part. I think Chicago's in there and and, uh, Mm -hmm. Pablo Cruz and and bands like those. But those are all veteran acts. It's not Mm -hmm. mixing that with, with the younger bands. So, but n- now Ringo is doing something along those lines. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And it's so, in its own regard. Right. It's kind of what I was saying before about the fact that Paul has kind of influenced other, you know, senior acts as far as, uh, you know, exposing themselves to the, you know, the, 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 the festival uh, atmosphere. Hmm. All right, one other news item I thought we'd bring up is this new movie. It's called Danny Collins, and um, Al Pacino is the star of this film, and it's actually a true story, and it's about uh, a British folk singer, and his real name was Steve Tilson. And um, back in 1971, um, he gave an interview to a small 
underground British magazine, which was named Zigzag, and it was done to support uh, the release of his first album. And he was asked if fame and fortune might uh, affect his career, might be toxic to his songwriting. He actually said in this in this interview that it will and that his heart will suffer. And uh, John Lennon actually read this interview and he wrote a letter to him. This really happened. This is not a fictional story. And he sent it to the magazine. And this was at a time when John was about to release Imagine. And um, in the letter, he said to Steve that money didn't change anything for him anyway. And uh, so he ended his letter by saying, so what do you think of that? It was a real brief letter. But the only problem was that this this uh, songwriter, Steve Steve Tilson, never got that letter until 34 years later. Um, in the movie, they say it's 40 years later. But um, in real life, uh, Steve's career has had its share of ups and downs. And um, like most musicians, he's, he's managed to make a living from it. And um, he's actually said, I read this one article, that he's lived a charm life and he wouldn't change anything at all. But in the film, they kind of change the story around a bit, and he's depicted as an aging rock star who um, can't give up the hard, hard living ways. And uh, so Al Pacino plays this singer, Danny Collins, and the movie itself actually has nine John Lennon songs in it. And if you've seen the trailer for it, they use Instant Karma in the trailer. And I know that um, Imagine's in there and Beautiful Boy and I think Working Class Hero is also in there. I don't know all the songs, but um, just kind of interesting that they, they took this story, which really did happen, and made a, you know, a film out of this. Yeah. So any of you want to comment about uh, just the idea behind this movie? Sounds promising. I mean, and I, I see that the cast also includes Annette Benning and um, Jennifer Garner, Christopher Plummer. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it, it looks like it might be... Um, entertaining film and always nice to hear uh what what people make of john lennon tracks on film soundtracks i wonder if he uh does he still have the letter or has he auctioned it to uh Mm. do this second phase of his career that i don't know Mm -hmm. if i was him i would just keep it (laughs) but uh i don't know that part of the story but the the film itself may increase its value you know it it becomes now not just a john lennon letter but a john lennon letter upon which a film was based that's true yeah and like you just said alan when there's beetle music or solo music and it's put into films that can be given exposure to new audiences so you know it's a great vehicle for introducing music to uh, you know different audiences, although I don't know if this would attract necessarily a young audience, but mm. um, you know we'll see. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, I mean, let's face it, John can't work with Kanye, so what else is there to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. I I just looked to see if there was a CD uh, soundtrack, and it doesn't appear that there is. So you just reminded me, Alan, of um, we were talking about Paul just now, but there was a, a story in. Q magazine. It's actually an interview with Paul, and I believe right. it's ten pages long. And I, I myself haven't read it. I've read Steve's article about it with some very interesting quotes in there. And he does talk about Kanye West in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he so, also talks about uh, about Nancy's reaction to the uh, the third collaboration, and uh, p- apparently she had much the same reaction that most of us have had to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't know was... if I don't know if you guys covered this one of the weeks I was absent, but of course Heather has resurfaced as well. That too. Oh yeah. Yes. And, and to yes, comment on McCartney and and Kanye. Yeah, she apparently said that he's working with Kanye to make himself more relevant. Mm-hmm. Right. And that uh, yeah. and that she finds it all very boring. That she doesn't. She doesn't really want to talk about him because she finds it all very boring when, you know, when in fact the only reason why anybody wants to talk to her is because of the fact that she's Paul's sex wife. Yeah. Yeah, well, she has a certain expertise in trying to make herself relevant and being boring. Mm -hmm. So, yes, (laughs) very true. Just thought it for I don't selectors think... of media out there. I thought I should mention that that article is. I think it was the Daily Mail. Uh, yeah, fairly yeah. long yeah. piece. And boy, did that get a lot of rea- a lot of reaction on social media. I mean, r- really, really 
incredible how much she still provokes people and i'm sure she noticed but you know well that's her you know that's her whole aim is to get attention i mean you know i mean from from very early on she was uh you know very very much of a galvanizing point for uh you know even in the early days of social media um and you know i always uh, you know uh, i always took the attitude of well just ignore her because you know because she is pardon the expression she is something of a media whore mm-hmm. very you know? much so yeah absolutely and so, uh, you know, I think the, the you know the, uh, the the preferable thing is to simply ignore her, but she <laughs> she won't allow that. <laughs> there were two quotes in the Q article that got a little bit of attention yesterday on on social media. Um, one was where Paul was talking about wor- why he was working with Kanye West, and he said, "I love his balls." <laughs> and, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that sentence was was you know quote taken out of context and quoted taken out of context. <laughs> yeah and um you know so that was that was interesting and the other one was the fact that he said he talked about um you know that he finishes songs in the toilet like you know he gets his inspiration from the toilet which isn't really you know which is again bending bending the uh context just a little bit but yeah i mean it's weird the, i mean it's it's actually a, a halfway decent interview you know and there's some very i mean he talks at length about the songwriting process and everything but of course you know people you know were looking for stuff to pull out and grab it on a, oh, you know, as attention and and that's what they that's what they focused in on when in fact the article itself is actually very you know is is a is a good article it's very interesting you know, and very informative on how he talks about writing a song. So, mm-hmm. well, the you know the, the the whole toilet thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, obviously it's a male thing, but you know, many males do. We do some of our best reading. You that's, know? That's, <laughs> that's true. In the bat in the bathroom, you know, yeah. and so it's, it's it makes sense that he would uh, find that a place that is good for songwriting. And the other the other thing he that was interesting in the article, getting back to what Ken was saying earlier about Ringo's mother, you know, uh, uh, I mean, parents passing away, mother dying and all that, is mm-hmm. that uh, Paul says that a lot of songwriters have their mothers die. Yeah, think so. yeah. Uh, Paul, Paul is one, Connie West, uh, Bono is another. Um, mm-hmm. So they're, you know, that's uh, John Lennon, of, car- of course. Um, sure. So there, I mean, that was another interesting, you know, point he made in the article, and mm-hmm. that they that they focused in on in the Q magazine piece. It's going to be, you know, for anybody that's interested in reading it, it's going to be probably a month before it gets here in print form. But if you have, uh, you know, if you have an iPad, you can pick it up for uh, five dollars on uh, through uh, um, the Apple the new, newsstand app, the newsstand, yeah, uh, or uh, Google Play, and uh, and I have the link in the story that I wrote about the article, and and um, yeah, I mean, I that's how that's obviously how I got it because uh, I wasn't going to wait a month for it to to come out. So, mm-hmm. um, you know what I found really interesting from your article, what you pulled out of that interview? He actually said that "Bip Bop" was the worst song he's ever written. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, and I said he said that that was the worst lyrics he ever wrote. He bleeping worst lyrics, I think, mm-hmm. is the way yeah. it was phrased. Yeah, and uh, I always thought he liked the song because he included it on on Wingspan on the collection. Mm-hmm. He didn't have to do that, so mm-hmm. I thought that was like a personal song going back to, you know, the early marriage with Linda and the kids and Bip Bop and. You know, playing it on acoustic guitar, and I just thought that, you know, that that was like a personal favorite of his. But now he's right. recognizing it as as the worst. And uh, one interesting thing is that he he talked about uh, working on the remaster for Tug of War right. and redis- rediscovering what's that you're doing with Stevie Wonder as the other duet. But that right there is proof positive that that will probably be the next remaster along with Pipes of Peace, mm-hmm. as we've heard. So Right. Right. So 
but yeah, that uh, it's a. I mean, I, I I recommend the article if you you know, especially if you, I mean, if you like Paul interviews, you're going to get it anyway. But I mean, as an informative interview, it's it's very good. It's very very good. Hmm. All right, so we have a uh, a major passing to talk about here, which happened a couple of weeks ago actually, and that is that of Albert Mazels, the documentarian who, along with his brother worked on uh, the early Beatles documentary, What's Happening, The Beatles in the USA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your thoughts about uh, his passing. I met him a few years ago when the Beatles' first U.S. visit came out and um, got a chance to interview him, and he was really just a great person to talk to and uh, very proud of working on that particular film, as well as everything else that he's known for. He also worked on The Love We Make with with Paul. But uh, what do you guys have to say about uh, his great contribution in uh, the history of the Beatles. I think what's happening USA is, I mean, a lot of people have said this over the years. It's not a, a great new insight, but it's, it's basically sort of hard day's night in real life, you know? And, and mm. uh, I think the script for hard day's night was written before they came here, probably even before the film was shown. But um, it's kind of interesting how similar aspects are. You know, they're on a train for part of it, and uh, although it's it's not at the beginning, but you know, the idea of showing them uh, and what they go through is 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 kind of similar. Hard Day's Night is is obviously fictionalized, but you know, the fact that they had access to them on that trip and that. Um, the Beatles seemed to feel completely comfortable um, with these guys was a major thing because, uh, you know, it, 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 at the time, I don't even know if it was, was seen here very much. It was they did it for Granada TV in England. And, you know, but now we look at it in, in hindsight and especially in the uh, the two versions that Apple has put out, uh, first U.S. visit. And I can't remember what the second one was called, but it was a expanded two DVD set with lots and lots of outtakes. Mm. Um, you know, that showed an incredible amount of what it was like to sort of hang out with them at that time. And Albert Mazel's himself, I mean, you know, that's not the only thing he did, obviously. They did Gimme Shelter. They did plenty of mm. other documentaries. And their their whole style was to be sort of fly on the wall as these events were unfolding. And uh, and they they really made an art form of the documentary, you know, documentary without a voiceover personality telling you what you think you should – they think you should be seeing – but hmm. simply inserting you into the scene and letting you see it happen. They were really incredible at that. I, I saw him, you know, he last year or a year or two ago, he was at the um, uh, Museum for Television and Radio. Now it's called the Paley Center hmm. uh, on a couple of panels to sort of celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival. And um, on one of the things, since he was around, uh, I was doing a, an interview with Mark Lewis and, um, at the Paley Center. And since Albert Mazels was you know, coming to some of these things as a panelist, uh, we invited him to join us about halfway through. And, uh, you know, it was great because we were we were showing some film clips and he was commenting uh, some of his comments, you know, at that point were were showing, you know, when people get older, they get a little forgetful and they begin to say mm -hmm. the same things over and over. But, you know, it was just great having his insight, whatever he was able to give us. And, uh, yeah, it's that was a big loss, I think. It's it's uh, very interesting because the uh, what's happening the what's happening film is other than the Ed Sullivan shows that is the you know the only film document of that historic first trip to America by the Beatles and Give Me Shelter is the really the the main film document of that first kind of modern you know, post-mania period Rolling Stones tour with, of course, the, you know, the central theme of it, of course, being Altamont. So it's, uh, uh, you know, if for those, it, it's certainly in musical terms, for those two films alone, the Maisel's brothers are, you know, made of, you know, a, a major contribution to the, the world of music documentaries, of course. 
there's so much more than that. Yeah. How about you, Steve? Well, two things. Number one, uh, that scene where they're in the cab in what's happening uh, is, to my mind, one of the most incredible scenes ever because it's, mm. I mean, they're not acting in that. At least I don't think they are. They're not, it's their reaction as, you know, as it's happening and as the, you know, they're watching the, the girls swarm in the cab and everything. And it was just, that was just absolutely amazing. It really, it really was amazing. Um, and that scene and has I, one of the great, great Beatles quip lines in it too. Uh, we ain't written no poetry. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, there, and and the the Murray the case scene. That's another interesting scene in there. But I mean, there's a whole there's a whole lot of stuff in there. Uh, I love the fact. Uh, I, and I, I I'm I'm trying. My memory is is uh, there's a scene where they play. There's one a, one scene in there where they play a riff from a later Beatles song that everybody kind of points to and says Strawberry Fields. Oh, is it Strawberry Fields? Yeah, okay. Yeah. There you mm. go. Which is, yeah, I mean, that's really amazing, too. But on the other hand, uh, Gimme Shelter here in the San Francisco area had a lot of, you know, had a lot of um, interest because obviously it took mm, place. Of course. Um, yeah. Altamont, Altamont is about uh, maybe a, a less than an hour from where I am. Mm. And we passed the, that, through that area. I haven't been, I've never been there. I wasn't there for the concert, but we've been through that area. Um, and, you know, and a lot of what, uh, I mean, a lot of what took place took place here. I mean, it was uh, involved with KSAN, the, uh, which was then, then the freeform radio station, Sam Cutler, who, um, was the the Stones road manager was was in there and Jefferson mm. Airplane is in there. Uh, I, there's the the scene where you know where uh, somebody uh, hits one of the uh, Hell's Marty Angels. Ben- yeah, one of Mar- oh, the Hell's Angels hits Marty Ballon. Right. And and of course uh, the the you know the the, the death uh, um, you know that Rolling Stone covered at the time. I mean right. a lot of the, that that was very. You know that was something that was that got a uh, had a lot of interest in, and uh, obviously in this in where I'm in this area of where I am. But um, th- they did a great job on both of those films. Uh, I, I you know I have to say I'm not familiar with a, a whole lot of their other work. I did not particularly like the love we make. Um, I did no. not think that was, that was uh, Maisel's best work um, for several reasons. It should have been mm-hmm. better. It should have worked. Out, should have been a lot better than it was, but it, it was not. But uh, I I really like like that movie. Was it seemed a lot of it was very stage managed, I think, by Paul, and uh, and it was also very interesting that by the time it came out, any evidence of of Heather was excised from the film. (laughs) So I imagine he had to do. I imagine Albert uh, had to do a a whole lot of editing because she was certainly very much in evidence during that time, but not in the film. Just that that may account for uh, maybe some of uh, uh, some of its minuses. Because it's actually, less of a pure I, documentary in the exactly. sense of it's being stage managed and edited. Exactly. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have a good point there, but I think that it takes you through, you know, the promotion behind it, all the different people that that interviewed Paul. Um, yeah, it's it, you always have to ask the question when you have a camera on you, how much of you is really natural? Because you're aware there's a camera in front of you. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I enjoyed seeing most of it. I, I thought most of it was very real and very believable for me. So um, and also seeing the rehearsals for the concert. Oh, there, there's a lot that I in the film that I find entirely believable. And when he's in the car, he's he's being chauffeured around in New York City and he doesn't want to sign an autograph because he feels probably it's going to just be sold, yeah. you know, and uh, it, it's, I think that's very real. You know, I, I think um, it's a genuine film, although, like I said, you know, you got a camera in front of you. You're very much aware of what you're saying as you're saying it. So, um, you know, there is that aspect of it. Whereas, you know, the Beatles documentary there was as real as could be. And that was, uh, you know, as entertaining, especially on the train. I mean, just seeing them... As they were, that was the the one criteria is for them to just be natural, be themselves. That's what Paul said when uh, Albert passed away. Was that those those were the instructions that they were given? Just be yourself, and um, you certainly you captured that. And and especially on the train, taking pictures on the train, smoking cigarettes, clowning around, 
doing whatever they felt like doing without being conscious of the camera. And so you really felt like you were there, you know, in that moment. So call it cinema verite, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, yeah, a very enjoyable film and uh, definitely a big loss, Albert Maisel's. Mm-hmm. So um, any anything else we want to talk about? Did you want to mention any other passing? Well, we could mention really quick, Cynthia, even though we covered it in the last show for anybody that didn't hear it. We did do a special show, but uh, actually on the day we're taping this, Cynthia Lennon has passed. And, I mean, we pretty much covered it in the last show, but, um, I mean, obviously that's a, a huge loss. But, uh, I, I, I mean, there isn't really much else to say there uh, as far as that goes. It seems like uh, things are starting to pick up as far as, uh, and not surprisingly, you know, because everybody's getting older. I mean, we're starting to lose people more and more now, and that's really, really going to get, you know, it's going to really going to be uh, uh, something we will be watching. Obviously, well, this has uh, been a, this is this has been accelerating over the last uh, year or two, where it seems like almost every week we're losing some pop culture luminary or music luminary sometimes in bunches but it seems like almost every week you know even uh you know even as someone as uh, ordinary as the fellow who invented the pet rock <laughs> yesterday <laughs> really you know but uh it's uh you know i i think i had uh, i i hadn't even been aware because having been away for the weekend of the the fest for beatles fans that michael brown the lead singer and principal writer for the left bank had passed away mm-hmm. so you know that just goes to show you there's you know more and more and more we're losing so many of the uh the you know the music and pop culture luminaries of uh, of our time, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of shocking, but uh, the reality is, you know, if you grew up in the '60s, anyone who was 20 years old that you were exposed to then, if they're alive now, is 70 or more. Yeah, exactly. So even if you're in the best of health, anything could happen at any sure. time. Yeah. So that's why I always say appreciate these people while we can. I'm just so grateful that. You know, we got the people that we still have with Paul and Ringo, you know, right. and uh, the few, I mean, George Martin, God bless him. Mm-hmm. He's 89 years old. He's still right. going strong. Sure. But, uh, you know, hold on to these people while we got them and appreciate them while they're here. So, yeah. and with that, that puts the show to a close. So if you would like to get in touch with us here at our show, uh, our email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And uh, if you can, please take a look at my website. It's called KenMichaelsRadio.com. Lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles, including my new interview with Ringo Starr, which you can find on there. And uh, Beatles trivia and special contests all the time. In fact, by the time this airs, there's a contest where you can win the Blu-ray for the concert for Nebworth. So uh, by all means, if you can, take a look at the website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Al, if people want to get in touch with you, they can do so how? Uh, best way is through my Facebook page under Al Sussman or uh, on Twitter at uh, asus49 uh, or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. Those are, that's probably the, uh, the most direct way. Okay, and how about you, Alan? Probably also Facebook uh, at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, on Twitter, at Cozen. All right. And you, Steve? You can catch me on examiner.com. Not only the Beatles examiner, I'm the McCartney examiner, I'm the George Harrison examiner, the Ringo Starr examiner, I'm even the Weird Al Yankovic examiner. I'm everywhere. But I have my own Facebook page. I have a a news group, uh, Beatles News and Commentary page. And, of course, you can catch all of us on the Things We Said Today radio page and group that page. Too, yes. Yeah, so. and I have my own Facebook page, which I forgot to mention, at Ken Michaels. All right. So on behalf of Steve, Al, and Alan, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for joining us. And we will see you all next time.